Roman, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so today I will talk about uh, how we can uh, do fast text processing uh, in Python using Rust extensions, but also more broadly how we can build uh, Rust extensions to for high performance Python. Um, a few words about myself. So I'm uh, my background is physics. I was doing computational plasma physics before, um, and now I'm. I'm working as an independent consultant on data science. And I'm also an active uh, scikit uh, open source contributor, in particular to scikit-learn and to PyDite projects, uh, which I will mention later. So uh, let's look at how a uh, scientific Python ecosystem has been traditionally built to be high performance. Essentially, we have, uh, let's look at SciPy, for instance. So SciPy has like a Around half, uh, half uh, in the lines of code of Python it has 24% of Fortran, 19% of C, and a bit of C++. And essentially, the performance parts are due to those compiled languages, in particular Fortran and C. And uh, interestingly, if you look at how often those files change, we will see that Python files change much more often than C or Fortran. For instance, Fortran, on average, it was contributed maybe six years ago, and nobody actually touched it since. I mean, it works, it's very stable, it's very, like, robust, but, but it also means that we are, we are missing some of the, like, performance improvements we could get just because maybe the algorithms could be written better or things could be done better. And so, so it's, 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 uh, I mean, it applies to SciPy, but I'm, sure, I'm sure it also applies to another, an, an, a set of other libraries. Um, so what are the alternatives? Well, uh, there is a number a number of alternatives uh, that you can use. For instance, the if a popular one is Cyton, so we will write a pseudo Python code that will be compiled to C and then build as a C extension. Uh, Pitran, Numba is a just in time compiler, and essentially all of those work really well. However, they're um, they're very interlinked with Python. <laughs> what I mean mean by that is that. Um, you are part of the Python ecosystem, and it means that you cannot use actual libraries builds outside of this ecosystem, or li like uh, make use of uh, other libraries. Uh, unlike if you go, for instance, into C or, or C++, of course, there you can uh, like you can use libraries developed by other people. You don't have to do everything from scratch. I mean, it also applies to Cyton, but um, just broad idea. And uh, and more recently, you can actually also build uh, extensions using Rust. And this is the subject of this talk. Uh, so just a quick show of hands. Who has used Rust before here? Great. Who has heard of Rust? <laughs> okay. Uh, so Rust is a high-performance uh, system programming language, which focuses on uh, memory safety and, in particular, on safe concurrency, which is important if you want to do high-performance um, computing. Uh, so one one prominent feature of Rust is it has a package manager, uh, meaning that you can, uh, when you want to use some functionality, you can just uh, you know you don't have to manually compile uh, or build uh, something as you would do in C or C++. It uses uh, automatic memory management at compilation time, so it means that you don't have a garbage collector, uh, but uh, memory is going to be allocated and deallocated depending on its use in, uh, in in the code at the compilation time. So this is useful if you want to interlink, like if you want to link it with uh, with another language such as Python, because Python has its own garbage collector, and it means that be because Rust doesn't have one, it's easier to to make them communicate essentially. And also no another nice feature is uh, is that you can uh, detect a sim uh, like uh, vectorized instructions at runtime. So it means that you can make a single binary, and depending on the on the CPU you're going to run it, it's going to use the right uh, uh, CPU instructions to, to to be faster. So and this is more or less transparent to you. So if you use just some dependencies that do this, you will you will automatically get the benefit of it. Uh, so now let's talk about writing uh, ex extensions uh, for Python in Rust. So essentially, the main the main project we're going to use is uh, Python three, which provides those bindings to the C Python int interpreter. It also w works for PyPy, by the way. And then we have the Rust NumPy project, which uh, which provides bindings to to the NumPy C NumPy C API. So there is a, also a young but growing ecosystem of scientific packages around this. Uh, one one small issue is that for now Pio3 requires Rust unstable, so you cannot use it on the stable branch of Rust, which is not that great for production systems, but yeah. 
So let's let's do a simple example. We'll want to say sum a vector. Um, so we will just take a, uh, a view into this array of uh, of float 64, 64 here, and we'll apply the sum operator in uh, from the ND array library. So ND array is is like an equivalent of NumPy for for us, say. And actually, people who who wrote it they also have a a con this convenient mapping of of different functions. So, for instance, you want to do I don't know, you want to do array creation. So then, in 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 NumPy you would do this, and and in the array you would do that. So it, it also gives you some idea of the of the syntax of how you can map your your computations in one or another. Uh, so I don't know. There's like all this standard NumPy operations, and then slicing, and uh, and then like um, basic mathematical operations. Uh, so, so we have now this function in Rust, right? So, I mean, here it's a very simple, simple piece of code, but we, you can imagine like building a more, more complete uh, computational pipeline. And uh, we want to use it in Python. So we'll just write, write a wrapper for it in, uh, in Python 3. Uh, the wrapper in this case would look something like this. So, so it's a bit, uh, there is a bit of boil, boil, boiler plate code here. But I mean, if you have written wrappers in, uh, like, uh, in C, you'll know that it's not necessarily very, very pretty. But the point is that it will uh, it will allow you to to create a a Python module and uh, sorry a, a Python module that you can then import in Python and just pass it uh, an NumPy array and it's going to like ret return the result. So this is the basic idea. And then uh, the question is uh, so the the project I'm going to present is how we can apply this on a particular example of of text vector, text vectorization. So what is text vectorization is uh, essentially how we take a document and convert it to a sparse uh, uh, sparse uh, matrix that we can do actually machine learning on later on. So the basic pipeline is we take this document, we apply some preprocessing, some tokenization uh, to convert the documents to tokens, then potentially we concatenate tokens together uh, to get n-grams, and then finally we count uh, we count these uh, tokens into a sparse uh, sparse matrix. So so it's it's like very the, the very basic thing in in uh, in NLP. And uh, for instance, if you look, look in the Python ecosystem, those this is for instance can be done with scikit-learn uh, with the classes called count vectorizer and the hash vectorizer. So the hash vectorizer, what it does, it additionally uh, applies hash functions on tokens, so we can uh, reduce the size of the vocabulary. And um, I have been essentially uh, looking into for some time into how we can make those two classes faster, because this is uh, often a bottleneck in terms of you have a large document collection, you want to just apply some basic, uh, you know, linear model on it, and uh, just just uh, extracting tokens can take a while. So so if you look at the history of contributions in scikit-learn, there have been like a lot of small contributions. Uh, incremental things to tune out the performance there um, over the last several years. But however, it was never like the performance kind of reached the max, the optimum at the moment. And unless there is like major changes, it's not going to get improved. So what you could do, you could also, for instance, re uh, rewrite token counting in Cyton. So this is already done for hashing vectorizer. And unfortunately, we can see that in this particular case, it doesn't actually improve the performance that much because uh, part of the pipeline is still in pure Python. Then also the problem is uh, if you um, if you want to rewrite it in Cyton, it means that you have to handle Unicode. And basically, you have to handle Unicode in C, which is not something, at least personally, that I would like to do in my free time. Uh, and um, and also another thing is uh, tokenization is a bottleneck. So the tokenization is just uses the regex Cyton library, and so basically this is one of the bottlenecks that we, it's a bit hard to address. So another approach could be to um, to use uh, parallelization with Dask. So this works well, for instance, in the case of hashing vectorizer, which is stateless. It means that it doesn't. Uh, have a state, and you can apply it basically to chunks of the data set independently. So here with this uh, map partition um, function, and then concatenate the result, and you'll get the essentially the result on your full data set. So this works, but it's um, let's say it's 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 still uh, work around around the fact that the, our basic transformation function is a bit slow. So th so the question I was wondering about, can we actually make it a bit faster by writing a Rust extension? So 
first nice uh, comment, like uh, observation, was that if we just use the so the basic um, tokenization is just you, you call regex with some uh, expression and you apply the find all function. So this directly calls to the C Python implementation of uh, Bree module, right? And actually, if you if you do the same thing in Rust and like with, with including the Python wrapper, just this is going to be t twice faster because Rust has a bit more a newer implementation of regex and it's a bit better at the moment. And also there is nice packages such as, uh, for instance, Unicode segmentation. So Unicode segmentation is a spec on how we, uh, uh, how we basically, uh, well, tokenize, uh, uh, sentences and, uh, into, into words. And if you apply this just like the basic, um, uh, package in Rust, with a few additional rules in the sense that there are a few NLP specific rules of how to, you should tokenize texts. For instance, if you look at the, this sentence, um, the can't, uh, it's usually tokenizes uh, CA and uh, T, uh, to, to, like, to, to denote the negation. But anyway, so this you have to add it additionally because Unicode segmentation, it doesn't handle it. But in the end, you, you get something which is essentially reasonably fast. So if you compare it, for instance, to, uh, to, to the Python uh, regex version just above, it's it's um, it's twice faster if you just use the regex in Rust. If you use this more complicated Unicode segmentation thing, you'll get equivalent performance. However, if you then look at the accuracy, so here we measure, measure the accuracy on the universal de dependencies tree bank. Uh, sorry, um, you'll see that the regex get a F1 score of uh, zero eight. Uh, on English or in French, for instance. Uh, for instance, if you compare to Spacey, Spacey is really good. It has a lot of like uh, more advanced rules. It gets a pretty good uh, uh, F1 score here. But uh, in terms of performance, you you get a bit lower because you have a lot of like manual rules that need to be checked. And uh, actually, uh, like Vtex, this package, so you'll get a, a pretty good uh, F1 scores while uh, the performance actually also significantly higher. Of course, I mean, this benchmark is a bit preliminary, so... We, the, here, the, essentially, the rules have been tuned to get the score high, so, so Spacey does a lot of more things than Vtext, but like, it's just a, an illustration of uh, how you can con tokenize text. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's look into a bit into detail what we need to do to do token counting. So um, for instance, one of the things that's uh, nice uh, in terms of workflow is that imagine you're in... Um, uh, you know, you, you write your function in Cyton. So, and then you need a hash function. So, um, a hash function is, uh, like a hashing algorithm, say. So, for instance, you have the, the, the common ones are, uh, for instance, murmur hash, xx hash, etc. So, for each one you want to use, you'll have to, well, either install a Python package, but then you can't use it in, in Cyton because it's, it's going to be too high level and it's not going to be fast enough. Or you can actually take the, the source code, compile it locally, and then try to build it and see if it works and uh, iterate like that. But actually, that that's a bit like uh, takes time. Well, if you use do it in Rust, you can just like uh, import a given module. It'll go and be built fine, and then you can just use it directly. So this is a, a nice. Uh, well, it it makes experimentation much faster. Another thing is uh, if you want to make this uh, token uh, count counting parallel, for instance. All you had to do here is that, so for instance, here, this is our data set of documents. Normally, what we would do, we, we apply, uh, we, we map uh, for each document, we apply some pipeline. So for instance, here, we tokenize and we hash. And then if you want to do this parallel, essentially here, we just had to use a parallel iterator and basically it's, it's going to multi-thread it without much effort on, on my side. Um, so here, for instance, the comparison of uh, the scikit-learn version of, uh, so this is the speed in uh, in, in megabytes per second of text. And then the Vtex is just a single thread that is already like significantly faster. And then you can also essentially use multiple cores. Um, so, so to summarize, we have a simple, uh, so basically it's a, it's a package for simple NLP uh, in Rust with Python bindings. We have like some of the features I talked about are as, such as tokenization, uh, token counting. Uh, there's also say stemming and some string edit distances. So you can actually install it with pip. Uh, there are binary wheels for, for different platforms. So you will not, when you use it, for, uh, you will not actually know that it's done in Rust because it's just a binary well, package. Well, it's still an alpha, some, so the API is still going to be move a bit. But So this is just like an experiment of how you can write uh, Python, uh, Python bindings for Rust. 
a few uh, a few more ideas of, of where to go from here. So, for instance, uh, what you can do is you can build uh, WebAssembly binaries from from the Rust uh, package. Who knows who heard about WebAssembly? Yeah. So, WebAssembly is essentially a binary format that you can run inside the browser. So, for instance, you can call it from JavaScript. So, this would allow, for instance, to use the core of this package from JavaScript. And more interestingly, um, there is there was a project that aimed to build actually C Python and uh, NumPy and uh, all these basic um, like uh, core core scientific packages into WebAssembly, so it can run inside the browser. Browser. So this package, uh, this project is called Pyodide. And the question is, can we actually use uh, the binaries we built previously there as well? So that would mean that you can actually say you have a web page. You can apply tokenization on some on some text you see on the web page inside your browser. And so, so this is all essential experimental ideas. It's, it hasn't been that, done yet. I mean, but it's just like ideas of nice things we can try to do. And uh, also, there is uh, another project called Wasmer.io. Uh, and essentially, what it allows you to do is from Python to run this WebAssembly binary. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it means that basically your uh, your code is going to run on any platform. So, for instance, you 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 build the binary once, and it should essentially run Linux, Mac. Uh, Windows, etc., but also say on uh, on some um, non-standard architecture such as ARM or or etc. Well, less uh, less standard, let's say. Uh, so this could be an interesting like in the future. This could be an interesting way of actually uh, building uh, a platform independent Python build. Um, another uh, interesting projects that were a bit in the same ecosystem are, uh, for instance, Rust Python. So this is an implementation of a Python interpreter in Rust. So it's, it's it aims to be exactly the same as uh, C Python, but in Rust. And personally, I'm also um, attached to a project called uh, Argmin. So this uh, essentially does a numerical optimization in Rust uh, with Python bindings. So, for instance, in my application, if you look at uh, machine learning libraries, they often uh, like the classical machine learning libraries. They often use the LBFGS optimizer. So this uh, optimizer comes from SciPy. And it's essentially, uh, I don't know, maybe a thousand lines of Fortran code that ha nobody has really touched in a while. And um, in particular, for instance, you cannot use it with floats 32. And so it's, it's a bit difficult to iterate, uh, like to improve, like to, to iterate there. And uh, one of the goals could be to expose this optimizer written in Rust from Python and use it, for instance, in machine lear learning libraries. Um, other, uh, so, so I have been developing Python for a long time before I went to experimenting with Rust and just a few observations I made while just changing languages. Uh, so uh, automatic formatter tools are really good. So, so in, in Rust, you have this cargo format in, in Python, the equivalent is black. And it's really, it, it's, it's actually interesting to see what happens if the, everybody uses it. So in Rust ecosystem, everybody used their formatter. I think in Python, if everybody started to use black, that would be like a significant improvement. Um, so uh, there is the 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 way of uh, packages are um, versions are pinned in, in in packages is interesting as well. So for instance, in Rust, you will uh, you take one package, it will have uh, fixed uh, dependencies, right? So for instance, you can I don't know, you take your package, uh, it depends on on a version of NumPy, and uh, it's only this version. And then a different package, if you install at the same time, it it can depend on a different version of NumPy. So that potentially means that you will have to install twice the same thing. So in Python, it's obviously not going to work, but but there is some interesting ideas there, and I guess some of them maybe are solved by tools like Poetry or Pip and uh, etc. So I mean, just some thoughts. I guess my uh, tendency was to use actually Dix for everything because, like in Python, this is the basic structure and um, you know, it's it just uh, you use it everywhere. Well, essentially, if you think about it more as a as a as a, as a mapping between uh, one type and another type, then you think that maybe in some cases Dix is not the best thing. And actually, you 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 start to realize that when you, for instance, uh, type your uh, Python code. And finally, uh, better type inference uh, with PyPy or Cyton. Um, would be nice. It, that that would in, in particular involve having uh, types in in the core scientific Python libraries such as NumPy and SciPy, which are currently missing. But if if you build your third party uh, uh, like your user code on that, you cannot. I mean, types are not going to be that useful unless un unless all your dependencies are typed. 
well, have have typed annotations. Um, well, in conclusions, uh, essentially using Rust extensions uh, for core algorithms can make uh, Pyth scientific Python better. Um, so, I guess the same applies to to the um, to the talk about Julia previously. Uh, beyond the actual performance you get from uh, from just using a different uh, like compiled language. Uh, well, in this case, uh, you also have access to the ho this whole new ecosystem, and it's interesting to to just be aware of that and to know, okay, well, we need to solve this problem. How did people in this ecosystem solve it previously or already? Um, and of course, because uh, Python has a has a history of uh, wrapping different codes for in Fortran C, etc. If you have some feedback on the Rust NumPy uh, package in terms of API, that would be very welcome. Um, and of course, there's another different interesting project that could be made uh, where, where writing Rust extensions could be useful, for instance, for parsers. So, um, for instance, there is the OpenML project, which, which, is a, uh, which um, collects data sets that can be used for machine learning. So this is, for instance, used in scikit-learn currently. And there is a, this, uh, so this project uses the R format to, to include the, the data and the metadata. And the parsers we have right now in pure Python are, are really slow, which means that when you actually try to load the data set in scikit-learn, it's going to be slow. Uh, so in that case, for instance, writing parsers, again, Writing parsers in Python is not something that's like very, uh, um, how do you say it? Um, well, very nice. So in that case, using a bit in a different language could be interesting. As I mentioned previously, Argmin, for instance, Apache Arrow has also a Rust implementation, etc. So I think I'll stop here. Um, any questions? Great audience. Uh, applause without cue. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for this. I think I was the only person who had never heard of Rust. Um, but I felt that this, even though this talk was uh, at least very useful to me, I saw a lot of engaged faces. So we have, uh, since you were so kind to finish early, uh, we have more time for Q&A. Um, I already see a first hand. Anyone else? Okay. Sorry, I need to run to give you the mic. Thanks for the talk. Um, just curious if you have tried a similar approach with C++. No. And, uh, so, so, if you have any so, like, so, maybe so, so, performance so. measurements and stuff. I mean, because I I really like Rust, mm. uh, but leaving aside all the WebAssembly, mm. I don't see the gain of using Rust. I mean, it says, for me at least, maybe naively, C++ will be closer to what C offers in C Python. So that's why I'm always curious why going to the Rust direction to bind yet another language to to improve python just curious i mean i know that it's better for us if we have more languages and stuff but just curious uh, what is your stand of doing the same thing with c plus plus and why not or these kind of things yeah thank you for the question so indeed i haven't talked about c plus plus too much because uh, in particular i don't have any experience with c plus plus so i think a lot of what i said also actually applies to c plus plus and i think i mean modern c plus plus is also very nice and has a lot of like good things um so so it's not like you know let's say there are some 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 uh, nice things in rust there are some nice things in c++ so for instance rust has this uh, in terms of um, safety it's a bit better because the the like the, the you have uh, this uh, memory management which avoids a certain number of like uh, errors or sec faults etc on that side maybe the the learning curve is a bit like more difficult i mean i think it's yeah you know there is no one solution to everything so it's it's good to have a choice and uh, yeah so in my case, I was a bit also attracted by the WebAssembly side, but. Um, I was wondering if you have any knowledge how the Rust compiler deals with GPU architectures or does it? <sighs> so, I mean, Rust is based on uh, LLVM, so I guess you... I mean, to be honest, I'm, it, that's not like really something I know a lot about. But uh, I, I mean, I know people are writing things in Rust for, for TVM, and I think it has some GPU backends. But uh, um, yeah, so more questions. Where? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks for the talk. Uh, in combining Rust and Python, what did you find to be kind of the hard part of getting the play together, particularly the two different memory models where there are particular sticking points where they either couldn't or didn't seem to want to play nice? Um, well, let's say uh, so far, so this project is, is, is kind of a side project for me, so I haven't like spent that much time on it and like i think if i spent more time on it i would i would have encountered more more issues uh, that you mentioned so so far like the experience have been more or less smooth but it's also like this whole thing of doing rust extension for python is fairly new so things are a bit still experimental and i think if more people used it and try to build things with it it will be be in better shape overall but but yeah but the fact that uh at least you don't have to handle memory, uh, handle the memory management on the Rust side is a nice thing because like it means that there is no garbage collector, but at the same time, you don't have to allocate, deallocate things manually, which is always a problem for me when I like do C Python, uh, like in C to, to, to remember to increment, decrement, uh, like reference counting. But, uh, yeah, I, I think, I think, uh, you really need a project that where you work work on it full time to actually uh, understand the limitations. Uh. Hands? No hands. <laughs> no more questions. You don't have to ask questions, but he's from Paris, so this is <laughs> you know like your uh. last chance. No. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.